Hi everyone. This is Laura with Stuff I Find Interesting. And I feel like my camera's all jacked up again. Crooked, right? Uh, it's like, should I, shouldn't I? Let's see. Maybe that'll help. I feel like that's a little better. No. I need one of those little portable levels that I can like stick up there and then I can see if uh, if stuff is straight or not and yeah so anyhow it is what is the date today I feel like I don't even know um, today is August 27th it is a Sunday um, not much going on here I woke up and I said you know what I want to talk about some interesting stuff so here I am. Um, I tried to curl my hair. And it's a total mess. I thought it would settle down. It hasn't. Um, but I promised myself that I wouldn't be like Bane doing this and like go crazy trying to make myself look all pretty or whatever because that's not what this is about. So I know I'm rambling about something, but you women out there, you, you understand what I'm saying, right? You, you hit a certain age and, and you get, you get self-conscious and you're like, wow, I'm I'm not attractive anymore, or I'm not young, or I'm not beautiful, and you, you know, you get sort of frantic, right? And uh, I don't want to do that. This is me. No makeup except for lipstick. Messed up hair. Um, my pajamas are on under here. Um, I'm showing up as I am because the focus is on the interesting stuff. Without further ado. Um, so this is. <clears throat> Let me clear my throat. <clears> throat. That's a great song, by the way. Um, okay, so this is a print based upon a mechanical grotto with four, no, I mean, with three mechanical toys. This is around the 1700s, the mid to late 1700s. There was this guy out there named Jacques. Pierre, Pierre Jacques Dross, and he did um, these intense uh, mechanical gadgets, uh, watches, um, birds that sang, and they were just super duper duper far ahead of their time, almost like computers in the way that they operated. So this is obviously a little fantastical. I think the pyramids are things are kind of interesting. Um, here we can see one of the toys. She played the piano. Um, over here we have one of the scribes. I, I think he, I read he could write, I don't remember if it was 40 lines or 40 characters, um, but he, he could write. You know, you could say, I'm gonna make this thing write and hit a button and it, and it would write, which is really freaking wild, right? Now, when I first saw this, I didn't realize that this up here was also mechanical. Um, as far as size goes, I, th I think we're talking more like large dollhouse size. I, you know, I'll show you the size of the of the people in a minute, or the little gadget dudes. But this, there's not a whole lot of information out there about it. Um, you know, I, he was a, a master, a genius. He was like ahead of his time. He invented stuff that like, you know, people had never seen before. This particular article talks about the actual landscape part. And I didn't read it because I started getting very distracted and adding on way too many links. So I stopped myself and said, stop. And I put this here so that people can see it. So it looked like it was a landscape and there were these writing things and you could go and look at it. Now over um, the next decade, uh, the company that Jacques Dross worked for exported 600 clocks, snuff boxes, pocket watches and auto automata to the Imperial Court. Several pieces can still be seen in the Imperial Palace Museum. Now I've, I've talked about this before I think, I, there we go, there's the little people. Um, I wish they had like a banana for scale or something, right? Um, when I sold antiques and collectibles, I came across a an automata piece. Uh, it had enamel, 
and there was a little bird that was in the top that, that operated on a spring and then it chirped and spun around. Not quite as complex as this, probably very late 1700s it was made, early 1800s, probably 1800s, um, but it was part of the, this craze that you could command things to do what you wanted them to do by turning a, a switch or a key. So this was extremely ahead of its time. If we, if we scroll, this is the back of one of the, the this is the back of one of the writing pe pe peoples. The writer could write up to 40 letters and had over 6,000 moving parts. The musician who played tunes on her harpsichord and the droughtsman who could sketch four different images, a portrait of Louis the 15th of France, a royal couple, a dog, and Cupid driving a chariot pulled by butterflies. I mean, freaking wow, right? So this was officially called the Grotto and it was conceived as a mechanical picture by um, Jacques. And it was described as a contrast of art and nature and arrangement of rocks and gardens of huts and pieces of architecture. It occupies about four and a half feet square and two to three feet in height. The front of the work represents an elegant garden. Facing the garden was a low level mansion behind which was a Swiss landscape surrounded by rocks behind which the sun rises and then goes down exactly like the sun on our horizon according to the different seasons of the year. Amongst the trees can be seen a peasant's hunt, a mill, a stream, and grazing flocks, as well as caves and grottos with several figures and animals. I mean, it kind of goes on, and, and you can read more, but it sounds like just like mind-blowing, right? Could you imagine back then you seeing this thing? So we don't know what happened to the grotto. The grotto, it disappeared, like a lot of things do in history. Um... But it was, it, it, it was, it was, it was just, it, what, it blows my mind to think about it. Because I think about myself back then and how I would have felt about things and looked at things. And then all of a sudden confronted with this. It would have blown my mind. Here's some more history about Jacques. You can read about his humble beginnings and how he traveled around. This is like the, the uh, automata that I, that I had in my hands at one point but it was square and it had a little bit more enamel on it this one is a little bit more brass but the bird was very similar um it was not quite as complex as as the scribe this is the factory which still survives today they make watches these are some of the old timey new timey watches this is 2011 this is 1785 here's a picture of him looking very you know I think that it's a very mace masonic sort of thing, right? Oh, it seems weird. Why do guys do that? I don't know. So it goes on. Okay, I'm bored of that. I'm not interested anymore. The Romans are ruining the landscape with these modern buildings. This is a silly cartoon. But I randomly came across this on a Sunday morning, much like this one. And I was looking at the arches on this bridge, and it got me thinking about arches. And then somehow from arches, I ended up on triumphal arches. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So here's an example of a triumphal arch. Uh, this is a concept. I don't believe this was ever brought into fruition. But yes, they really were this fancy with all this stuff kind of going on. There's some artistic license taken for sure, but this is this is basically what, what they look like. They were very, very, very kind of over the top. Now, what is a triumphal arch? A triumphal arch is a freestanding monumental structure in the shape of an archway, ta-da, with one or more arch passageways often designed to span a road. In its simplest form, a triumphal arch consists of two massive piers connected by an arch crowned with a flat entablature or attic on which a statue might be mounted or which bears commemorative inscriptions. The main sculpture is often decorated with carvings, sculpted reliefs, and dedications. More elaborate triumphal arches may have multiple archways. Triumphal arches are one of the most influential and distinctive types of architecture associated with ancient Rome. 
Thought to have been invented by the Romans, the Roman triumphal arch was used to commemorate victorious generals or significant public events, such as the founding of new colonies, the construction of a road or bridge, the death of a member of the imperial family, or the ascension of a new emperor. Triumphal arches should not be confused with memorial gates and arches and city gates, and it goes into a little bit more of a, of a description by what they, what they mean by that. Um, so there's, like, there's a slight difference between, I gotta keep this close to my mouth, there's a slight difference between the two and how they're used. The camera just went bonk, didn't it? It sure did. Oh, come on. There we go. Is that? Hmm. We're gonna go with it. So that is what a triumphal arch is. We have some examples here. If you want to uh, check out, these are surviving ex examples of triumphal arches that were built a very, very long time ago. This one is 81 AD, 27 BC, 150 CE, 171 AD, 203 AD, you get the picture. Very, very old. Now, when we talk about triumphal arches, we can also see this influence in my messed up camera. <laughs> we can see this influence in churches as well, right? We can talk about what's called a rood. Now, what is a rood? A rood is where the triumphal cross goes. It goes in that arch. So that arch is very... Um, I mean, it's an, it's not just a, it's not just a thing created to like, you know, be fancy, right? It's also very practical, right? Like an arch, when you build something, an arch, um, someone who knows about architecture could probably talk more about the arch and how the arch works and the keystone and all that other stuff. I'll leave you to that. But we're talking about the rood real quick. Now, the triumphal arch and triumphal procession as antiquity identification means in European society in the 15th to 17th centuries. What does that mean? So this is an entire article that you can download. You have to do, get a little fancy, but you, you can figure it out. I, I believe in you. That talks about how 15th to 17th century Europeans heavily identified with the Romans, like they, they, the, it, it, it showed up in their art, their architecture, the way they dressed, um, all these little ways they sort of like took on that culture and, and subsumed it uh, into their own. So you can read that if you want. Now here we have some pictures of some arches, um, courtesy of Google Arts. I thought we would um, just kind of go through them, see what we got, that's kind of cool. That's the Arch of Constantine. The Arch of Constantine. See, that's really neat. Now, did you know you can go up into the L'Arc de Triomphe? Like, there's a little, like a little staircase thingy or something. Like, you can you can actually like go up in there. I did not know that until I started looking up triumphal arches. Um, and it goes on. The link will be in the thingy, and and you guys can check it out. Uh, it makes for a, a nice ten minutes sort of going through. Now, the second tallest triumphal arch in the world that is still standing is the Arch of Triumph, which is in Pyongyang, North Korea. Now, this thing is massive. Look at this thing. Bam! So, this was built similar to... What the heck is this guy's name? Hang on just a second. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Emperor Maximilian, who we're going to talk about in just a second, made an arch that he was like, this is like, it just was so completely over the top. It just, and that's why it was made. It was made as an ego thing. It was made as a, look at me, I can make the biggest, I can make the best. And that's kind of sort of what, what I believe this thing is. And not to take away from the beauty of it, um, in its simplicity, it's kind of cool. Like, I kind of dig it. Um, and it's, um, I'm sure it's got to be in the city center where there's like actual electricity and internet. As you all know, outside that area, there's not, people don't have a lot of anything, really. That's what it looks like at night. Now, the tallest 
monument is the Monument to the Revolution, and here it is. You can see the Art Deco influence. Um, Pancho, Pancho, was it Pancho Villa? Pancho Villa is in one of those those tower legs. I think there's like a emperor in there, or like a king. Let's see, what does it talk about? Um, it goes underground. It was built in 1938. Uh, Art Deco and Mexican social realism, like Diego Rivera. Uh, it's the tallest one in the world. Here we have a picture of it being built. It was originally supposed to be a legislative building. The Mexican Revolution deposed a crooked ruler and instituted democracy for the nation. So this whole concept of having this arch then became um, a statement of democracy. And it's a mausoleum for Mexican presidents and rebels. You can go there. There's an elevator that goes up to the top. There's an observation deck up there that so you can kind of see and underneath there's a uh, museum and art exhibit. And then from what I understand, there's an underground underground. And you can see there's some landscape grounds and nice little places where you could sit and chat. I would not mind going there. I think that's very cool. Now there are triumphal arches in the United States. This is just for you to look at. You can bring this up again, another cool 10 minutes of going through some stuff you might not realize, like this is New Orleans. That's huge, right? This is New York. This is the one I was talking about that's just like so over the top. This guy, he like, he put himself in like various scenes where he was like victorious. But also, and more interestingly, we have the flags of the different cities, states, families? I'm not sure. I, I attached an article where it probably goes into exactly what all of this stuff is. But the detail. So this was made up of, and you can kind of see here, right? You can see there's a seam, and then there's another seam right here. So this was actually made up of panels that were then meticulously put together because they didn't yet, they had not invented paper that could be that big where they could paint like, you know, and then, and then and for some reason he didn't want it to be a mural. I'm not really sure why. Maybe he got carried away as he, as he went along. I've certainly, I've, I've worked for wealthy men who did that. They would, you know, get into something and just go nuts. Um, I mean, I, I kind of go nuts when I find something interesting, so I guess I shouldn't run my mouth. Here's an article. It was made by pressing a whopping 195 woodcuts onto 36 sheets of paper. So there you go. Let me see where it hung. Where did it hang? Um, oh, there's a family tree in there, a column of his ancestors, uh, key events from his reign. Uh, anyway, it did not get built. It was just a thing. So this is, um, what's this guy's name? David Stefanovich. This is just a really kind of cool picture. Um, the, so the Triumphal Arch still shows up in um, books, movies. You know, you see it. Um, I remember recently watching, what was it? It was based on the Robert Jordan books, but there's an arch at the beginning of the series that they have to pass through. Um, so you can imagine that this would sort of be similar. Now, as I was looking up arches, I came across this cute little sort of paper that a middle schooler, a high schooler, I don't even know, wrote about arches. And it goes into theology and Judeo-Islamic philosophical and theological thought. Um, this person really goes into it, and I just found it absolutely fa f fascinating that this person from Chamukla, Chamukla Elementary School, or, you know, from the Chamukla area, I don't believe that this is actually, I don't think this is an elementary school person wrote this. But I'm like, 
That's fascinating. And this was actually better than the Wikipedia article, I thought. I, I enjoyed it more. And it goes into Maximilian and stuff. And So this guy is uh, Chuck Cook. So good job, Chuck Cook. Lives in Jay, Florida. Look, we could email him. I'm not going to email him. But he talks about Chamukla. So I said to myself, Chamukla, where, you know, Florida, like, where is that? Let's, let's look, let's investigate that, shall we? And what is it famous for? So I Google Chamukla, and the first thing that came up is this. The Chamukla Redneck Christmas Parade is canceled because it's become a trashy beer fest. No more redneck trash parade. Sorry. What else is Chamukla famous for? It is famous for its water as a healing source. Now, after the Civil War, the country was beat up. People were beat up. There was just very much a, a feeling of a need for healing. And if you look at the medical field right around this time is where psychology starts to become more part of regular life. There's weird machines that are being created to treat various ailments. There's potions that you can buy that have questionable ingredients that'll add vigor and, and, you know, to you. But one of the things that people started to do is they started to swim. And in Chamukla, Florida is where President FDR went to try to heal his polio and to get more movement. I believe there's an HBO series or movie that was made about that uh, you can look that up yourself I don't know what that is but everybody wanted to go swimming right and then we have some amazing pools that used to exist that don't exist anymore where you could go swimming this is Ocean Park California this was not like just for rich people you could pay or whatever and go in and swim all day this is in Dakota. This is in Helena, Montana. Now, I noticed that this thing was really fancy, and I said to myself, that's really freaking fancy in Montana. So I looked up the um, population, and the population, I believe, was like 5,000 or something. But it was like 5,000 really rich people because it was a gold town. And at this time that this was built, it, the town was booming. This is another place in Florida in Redondo Beach, Park Central, Sulphur Springs, you get the idea. Now one of the things that's happening across the country is that public swimming pools are disappearing because they cost money. They cost money to upkeep, they cost money to um, maintain, they cost money to staff, they cost money to um, just exist, right? Taxes on the land and whatnot. So that's something that's been disappearing, which is sort of distressing because I remember as a kid, as a poor kid, being able to go swimming for free or very little amount of money. And for an entire day, I could play with other kids, I could run around and I could, you know, I could, I could have fun. And I feel like it, that kind of stuff is being taken from our kids. Our kids aren't allowed to be kids. We shove a device in their hands and I don't know. It bothers me. And it's one of the many, 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 many reasons why I personally never chose to have kids because I don't want to have to lie awake and think about that stuff more than I already do. And if I have a kid, I did. I, I would think about freaking everything. I would drive myself even crazier. Anyhow, I digress. Let's talk about terma. Terma is a Tibetan concept that knowledge important knowledge, spiritual knowledge, has been hidden and will be found when the time is right. Now, the knowledge could be um, in the form of nature. It could be an, a sudden flash of insight. It could be an actual thing that is found. But there is a belief that there are things that appear in time exactly when they're supposed to, to progress the spirituality of the Tibetan religion and people, but not just all Tibetan. It's specific to, I apologize, I'm going to horribly mangle this probably, 
the Vajra, Vajrayana Nigima school tradition. Where is it? Um, it's in Tibet. Also, there's some in um, Bhutan. Um, Bhutan looks like an interesting place to, to get into. Now, in terms of, of the religion, it's a little bit more specific than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about it more as a concept, but this really sort of gets into what it is and where it came from. So it's not from, like, God, where this knowledge comes down from. It comes from these um, Tibetan monks of the past who were powerful, who had this, you know, crazy knowledge, and they knew that people couldn't handle it all at once or giving it to people all at once was not a good idea, so it had to be sort of broken up. This talks about some of the termas that have been discovered and revealed. I tried to read one, but as you can see, I didn't. Oh, look, there's a button that says English. Oh, I didn't see that before. Homage to Guru Yidam and Dakini. Pray to the Guru. Om Vaja Kila Kilaya Hom Fat. I visualize myself as the Yidam deity and above my head. Okay, it, it goes on and on and on. But they appear to be prayers of a sort. This goes a little bit more about Terma, but I like to think of it as um, this is like more like really going into it, which I'm more or less included for your edification if, if you want to read it. But the reason why I bring it up is because if you think about it, um, I have no idea why I have Bhutan. I think this is where part of the religion is. Let's scroll into where, oh, here, for some reason I was looking at Thimpu. I think there's a monastery there where they believe this is where the term of thing came from. I'm not really sure. I don't remember. <laughs> Anyhow, if you look at the world, you notice that there are things that are invented um, kind of all at once, all at the same time, right? Uh, a bunch of people kind of invented electricity around the same time. You know, a, a bunch of people um, invented modern computers at the same time. If you look at the past, you'll see the same, the same sort of pattern. And... I don't know, I kind of thought to myself that it's a form of terma, right? Kind of, like when the time is right, you know, the knowledge sort of comes. You know, where does it come from? Like if, when Nikola Tesla was asked where his ideas came from, he said he didn't know. They just, they came to him. And it could just be he was a really smart man. Or it could be he was able to tune in and pick up on things that most people couldn't. Or it could be maybe the time was right and there was a terma. Which is... um not the way that it's it's defined or used so hopefully I am not offending anybody it's just sort of there's not really a western concept that I was able to find other than um, multiple inventions you know um, or what was the term I forget the term and I don't know if I saved it but this is uh, accidental encounters with a badass 8th century Buddhist mystic this is sort of a personal um description about coming face to face with with someone who lives the way the Buddhists did back then and still do and the stuff that they believe and practice and it's so it's sort of like an interview it makes for good for good reading this is even more intense this is the most intense you'll get if you want to really kind of get into it um, so this week while I was Googling around, these are the things I found interesting. How likely are you to encounter a tiger in Russia? That popped into my head and I needed to look it up immediately, and so I did. Why is there an arc of lakes? From here to here, right? It's sort of interesting. It's because of glaciers. This I completely... I don't even know how I got here, but this is the... Thoughts of Montesquieu? Maybe somebody can tell me who that is. So I'm going through here. We got Lake Bacall, Bastille. Let's see if the United States is here. I'm curious. 
Nope. Oh, let's look up America. Maybe America is there. Nope. Hmm. How old is this book? I don't even know. Someone else can figure it out, but something I found that was interesting is um, there's a quote in here, and it says, I've always seen that to do perfectly well in the world, you have to look crazy and be wise. And I think that's kind of cool, right? You want to look crazy, but you want to be wise. You don't want to look wise and be crazy. Because so I've been there. I've been where I've looked wise. I've been totally crazy. Right now, I just look crazy. And I think I'm... I think I'm relatively wise. I've I've definitely I've definitely earned some wisdom along the way. Um, I'm looking around my camera to see what kind of music I got going on here. Um, this is not what I wanted. So I found a really cool song this week. Hopefully it's not copyrighted. Uh, I'm gonna play it and I'm gonna scroll through Google Arts while it plays. But to make this more interesting, we're gonna go to Random Word Generator. And then we're gonna go to random word generator. Bam! Gap. Hmm. Tread. Third time's a charm. Item. I don't like that one. Coat. Lake. Ah, that's a good one. Lake. So we go up here, we type in lake. And then we go down to here. And we can see, you know, not a lot of art. Let's generate another word. Flower. There's a good one, right? Flower. I'm sure there's got to be lots of flowers. Yeah, look at that. We hit the mother load of flowers. So I'm going to play the song. Um, Now we're going to look at art. I don't care if it's a fantasy. Anyway, what is reality? As long as I'm not hurting anybody. Your hate behind piety talked about this one before. There's the butterfly. There's usually stuff hidden in these. Strokes. And then you pull out. Ambrosius Boss Chair. That's a nice one. Trying to figure out how to download this one.
And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to close. Um, all the links will be in the little thingy. And I hope everybody has a great week. And with that, I'm going to just <laughs> mess this up like I always do. It's like mysterious. <laughs>